in which growing maturity rekindles the relationship between one pair of lovers, and self-absorption carries another pair to the brink of death. Chapter 17 Involuntarily going over in his memory the impressions of the conversations during and after dinner, Alexey Alexandrovitch went back to his lonely hotel room. Darya Alexandrovna's words about forgiveness produced nothing in him but vexation. The applicability, or non-applicability, of the Christian rule to his own case was too difficult to question one about which it was impossible to speak lightly, and this question Alexey Alexandrovitch had long ago decided in the negative. Of all that had been said, the words that had sunk deepest into his imagination were those of the stupid, kindly Sorolson. Acted like a real man, challenged him to a duel, and killed him. They all obviously sympathized with that, though out of politeness they did not say so. Anyhow, the matter's settled. There's no point in thinking about it, Alexey Alexandrovitch said to himself, and thinking only of his impending departure and the inspection business, he went into his room and asked the porter who had accompanied him where his valet was. The porter said the valet had just left. Alexey Alexandrovitch asked to have tea served, sat down at the table, and, taking up room, began working out the itinerary of his trip. Two telegrams said the valet, coming back into the room. Excuse me, Your Excellency, I just stepped out. Alexey Alexandrovitch took the telegrams and opened them. The first was the news of Stramov's appointment to the very post Karenin had desired. Alexey Alexandrovitch threw down the dispatch and, turning red, got up and began to pace the room. Quo vi perdere dementat, he said meaning by quos those persons who had furthered this appointment. He was not vexed so much by the fact that it was not he who had obtained the post, that he had obviously been passed over. What he found incomprehensible and astonishing was how they could not see that the babbler, the phrase-monger Stremov, was less fit for the job than anyone else. How could they not see that they were ruining themselves and their prestige by this appointment? "'Something else of the same sort,' he said biliously to himself, opening the second dispatch. The telegram was from his wife. Her signature in blue pencil, Anna, was the first thing that struck his eyes. "'I'm dying. Beg, implore you, come. We'll die more peacefully with forgiveness,' he read. He smiled contemptuously and threw down the telegram. There could be no doubt, it seemed to him in that first moment, that this was a trick and a deception. She wouldn't stop at any deception. She is due to give birth. Maybe the illness is childbirth. But what is their goal? To legitimize the child? To compromise me and prevent the divorce? He thought. But there's something it says there. Am dying. He reread the telegram, and suddenly the direct meaning of what it said struck him. And what if it's true? He said to himself. If it's true that in the moment of suffering and near death, she sincerely repents, and I, taking it for deception, refuse to come, it would not only be cruel, and everybody would condemn me, but it would be stupid on my part. 
Piotr, cancel the coach. I'm going to Petersburg, he said to the valet. Alexey Alexandrovich decided that he would go to Petersburg and see his wife. If her illness was a deception, he would say nothing and go away. If she was really ill and dying, and wished to see him before she died, he would forgive her if he found her alive, and fulfill his final duty if he came too late. For the whole way he gave no more thought to what he was to do. With the feeling of fatigue and uncleanliness that comes from a night on the train, in the early mist of Petersburg, Alexey Alexandrovich drove down the deserted Nevsky and stared straight ahead, not thinking of what awaited him. He could not think of it because, when he imagined what was to be, he could not rid himself of the thought that death would resolve at a stroke all the difficulty of his situation. Bakers, locked-up shops, nightcabs, caretakers sweeping the pavements. Flashed past his eyes, and he observed it all, trying to stifle with himself the thought of what awaited him, and what he dared not wish, but wished all the same. He drove up to the porch. A cab and a coat with a sleeping coachman stood at the entrance. As he went into the front hall, Alexey Alexandrovich drew a resolution, as it were, from the far corner of his brain and consulted it. It read, If it is a deception, then calm contempt and depart. If true, observe propriety. The hall porter opened the door even before Alexey Alexandrovich rang. The porter Petrov, also called Kapitanich, looked strange in an old frock coat, with no tie and in slippers. How is the mistress? Safely delivered yesterday. Alexey Alexandrovich stopped and went pale. He now realized clearly how strongly he had desired her death. And her health? Cornet, in a morning apron, came running down the stairs. Very bad, he answered. Yesterday there was a doctor's consultation, and the doctor is here now. Take my things, said Alexey Alexandrovich, and feeling slightly relieved at the news that there was, after all, some hope of death, he went into the front hall. There was a military coat on the rack. Alexey Alexandrovich noticed it and asked, Who is here? The doctor, the midwife, and Count Vronsky. Alexey Alexandrovich walked into the inner rooms. There was no one in the drawing room. At the sound of his footsteps, the midwife came out of the boudoir in a cap with violet ribbons. She went up to Alexey Alexandrovich and with the familiarity that comes from the nearness of death, took him by the arm and led him to the bedroom. Thank God you've come. She talks only of you, he said. Quickly, fetch some ice, the doctor's peremptory voice said from the bedroom. Alexey Alexandrovich went into her boudoir. At her desk, his side to the back of the low chair, sat Vronsky, his face buried in his hands, weeping. At the sound of the doctor's voice, he jumped up, took his hands away from his face, and saw Alexey Alexandrovich. Seeing the husband, he was so embarrassed that he sat down again, drawing his head down between his shoulders, as if he wished to disappear somewhere. But he made an effort, stood up, and said, She's dying. The doctors say there's no hope. I am entirely at your mercy, but allow me to be here. However, I shall do as you please. I... Alexey Alexandrovich, seeing Vronsky's tears, felt a surge of that inner disturbance that that sight of other people's suffering produced in him, and, averting his face, without waiting for him to finish, he hastily went to the door. From the bedroom came on his voice, saying something. Her voice was gay, animated, with extremely distinct intonations. Alexey Alexandrovich went into the bedroom and approached the bed. She lay with her face turned towards him. Her cheeks were flushed red. Her eyes shone. 
Her small white hands, sticking out of the cuffs of her jacket, toyed with the corner of the blanket, twisting it. She seemed not only healthy and fresh, but also in the best of spirits. She spoke quickly, sonorously, and with unusually regular and deep-felt intonations. Because Alexei, I am speaking of Alexei Alexandrovich, such a strange, terrible fate that they're both Alexei, isn't it? Alexei wouldn't refuse me. I would have forgotten. He would have forgotten. But why doesn't he come? He's kind. He himself doesn't know how kind he is. Ah, oh, my God, what anguish. Give me water, quickly. Ah, it will be bad for her, for my little girl. Well, all right. Let her have a wet nurse. I agree, it's even better. He'll come. It will be painful for him to see her. Take her away. Anna Arkadyevna, he has come. Here he is, said the midwife, trying to draw her attention to Alexey Alexandrovich. Ah, what nonsense. Anna went on, not seeing her husband. But give her to me. Give me my little girl. He hasn't come yet. You say he won't forgive, because you don't know him. No one ever knew him. Only I did. And even for me it was hard. His eyes, you should know. Seryosha has the same eyes. That's why I can't look at them. Did Seryosha have his dinner? I know everybody will forget. He wouldn't have forgotten. You must move Seryosha to the corner room and ask Marriott to sleep with him. Suddenly she shrank, fell silent, and fearfully, as if expecting to be struck, as if shielding herself, raised her hands to her face. She had seen her husband. No, no, she began. I'm not afraid of him. I'm afraid of death. Alexei, come here. I'm hurrying because I have no time. I haven't long to live. I'll be feverish soon, and won't understand anything. Now I do understand. I understand everything. I see everything. Alexey Alexandrovich's pinched face acquired a suffering expression. He took her hand and wanted to say something, but was quite unable to speak. His lower lip trembled, but he kept struggling with his agitation and only occasionally glanced at her. And each time he glanced at her, he saw her eyes, which looked at him with such moved and rapturous tenderness as he had never seen in them before. Wait, you don't know. Wait, wait, all of you. She stopped as if trying to collect her thoughts. Yes, she began. Yes, yes, yes. This is what I wanted to say. Don't be surprised at me. I'm the same. But there is another woman in me. I'm afraid of her. She fell in love with that man. And I wanted to hate you, and couldn't forget the other one who was there before. The one who is not me. Now I'm real. I'm whole. I'm dying now. I know I'll die. Ask him. I feel weights now. Here they are. On my hands. My feet, my fingers. My fingers are like this, enormous, but it will all end soon. There's one thing I need. Forgive me. Forgive me completely. I'm terrible. But my nanny told me that holy martyr, what was her name? She was worse. I'll go to Rome, too. There are deserts there, and then I won't bother anybody. I'll take only Seryosha and my little girl. No, you can't forgive me. I know this can't be forgiven. No, no, go away. You're too good. With one hot hand she held his hand, and with the other she pushed him away. Alexey Alexandrovich's inner disturbance kept growing, and now reached such a degree that he ceased to struggle with it. He suddenly felt that what he had considered an inner disturbance was, on the contrary, 
a blissful state of soul, which suddenly gave him a new, previously unknown happiness. He was not thinking that the Christian law which he had wanted to follow all his life prescribed that he forgive and love his enemies, but the joyful feeling of love and forgiveness of his enemies filled his soul. He knelt down and, placing his head on the crook of her arm, which burned him like fire through her jacket, sobbed like a child. She embraced his balding head, moved closer to him, and raised her eyes with defiant pride. Here he is. I knew it. Now goodbye, all. Goodbye. Again they've come. Why don't they go away? And do take these fur coats off me. The doctor took her arms away, carefully laid her back on the pillow, and covered her shoulders. She lay back obediently and gazed straight ahead of her with radiant eyes. Remember one thing, that all I need is forgiveness, and I want nothing more. Nothing. Why doesn't he come? She said, addressing Vronsky through the door. Come here. Come. Give him your hand. Vronsky came to the side of the bed and, seeing her again, covered his face with his hands. Uncover your face. Look at him. He's a saint, she said. No, uncover it. Uncover your face, she said crossly. Alexey Alexandrovitch, uncover his face. I want to see him. Alexey Alexandrovitch took Vronsky's hands and drew them away from his face, terrible in the expression of suffering and shame that was on it. Give him your hand. Forgive him. Alexey Alexandrovitch gave him his hand, not holding back the tears that poured from his eyes. Thank God. Thank God, she said. Now everything is ready. Just let me stretch my legs a little. There. That's wonderful. How tastelessly these flowers are done. Quite unlike violets, she said, pointing to the wallpaper. My God. Oh my God, when will it end? Give me morphine, doctor. Give me morphine. Oh, my God. My God. And she began thrashing about in her bed. The doctor and his colleagues said that it was puerperal fever, which in 99 cases out of 100 ends in death. All day there was fever, delirium, and unconsciousness. By midnight the sick woman lay without feeling and almost without pulse. The end was expected at any moment. Vronsky went home, but came in the morning to inquire, and Alexey Alexandrovitch, meeting him in the front hall, said, Stay. She may ask for you, and himself led him to his wife's boudoir. Towards morning the excitement, liveliness, Quickness of thought and speech began again, and again ended in unconsciousness. On the third day it was the same, and the doctor said there was hope. That day Alexey Alexandrovitch came to the boudoir where Vronsky was sitting, and, closing the door, sat down facing him. Alexey Alexandrovitch, said Vronsky, feeling that a talk was imminent, I am unable to speak, unable to understand. Spare me. However painful it is for you, believe me, it is still more terrible for me. He was about to get up, but Alexey Alexandrovitch took his hand and said, I beg you to hear me out. It's necessary. I must explain my feelings to you, those that have guided me and those that will guide me, but you will not be mistaken regarding me. You know that I had decided on a divorce, and had even started proceedings. I won't conceal from you that... When I started proceedings, I was undecided. I suffered. I confess that I was driven by a desire for revenge on you and on her. When I received your telegram, I came here with the same feelings. I will say more. I wished for her death. But... He paused, pondering whether to reveal his feelings to him or not. But I saw her and I forgave. 
and the happiness of forgiveness revealed my duty to me. I forgave her completely. I want to turn the other cheek. I want to give my shirt when my captain is taken. And I only pray to God that he not take from me the happiness of forgiveness. Tears welled up in his eyes, and their luminous, serene look struck Bronsky. That is my position. You may tramble me in the mud, make me the laughing stock of society. I will not abandon her. I will never say a word of reproach to you, he went on. My duty is clearly ordained for me. I must be with her, and I will be. If she wishes to see you, I will let you know. But now I suppose it will be better if you leave. He stood up, and sobs broke off his speech. Vronsky also got up, and in a stooping, unstraightened posture, looked at him from under his brows. He did not understand Alexey Alexandrovitch's feelings, but he felt that this was something lofty and even inaccessible to him in his worldview. If you enjoy this format, please leave a like and subscribe and return tomorrow for the next chapter.